Sonic. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sonic Talk, episode 508, recording today live on Wednesday, the 4th of October, 2017. Uh, belated happy birthday to my partner, uh, which was yesterday. We had a lovely day. And also, uh, thank you to our sponsors, who will be providing the prize this week, which is the uh, Isotope RX-6 uh, audio restoration package and suite. Uh, if you're wondering what we're talking about, the Sonic Talk is a podcast that's dedicated to all things to do with music technology, uh, surrounding music, controllers, synthesizers, software, um, plugins, all that kind of stuff. So do, do stay tuned. Uh, we'll be talking for about the next hour or so about such subjects. So it's lovely to have you all here. Uh, I want to say hi to the people in the chat room on YouTube. Uh, if you subscribe to us on YouTube, you'll get a notification. You can join us there live. Uh, you, the URL is there, sonicstate.com forward slash live, uh, youtube.com forward slash live. And then also in the IRC chat, we've got our own little IRC room. Uh, so hello there to everybody as well. That's sonicstate.com forward slash live, where you can see all of that good stuff there. Anyway, folks, uh, uh, we'll say hello to our guests uh, and the guests. Uh, hold on, I'm just going to scroll a window because I can't see everybody and it's a little bit disconcerting. Uh, we'll start perhaps with uh, Mr. Steve Hillier because we haven't seen him for a little while. Steve Hillier, of course, uh, producer, engineer, educator. Um, what else are you, Steve? Many things, I think. Uh, DJ, uh, oh, cook. DJ. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just um, I just came back from uh, Ljubljana. Uh, this weekend in uh, down in Slovenia, which is a really beautiful city I hadn't been to before, and did a little bit of um, uh, DJing in uh, around there. And uh, honestly, I would read it, uh, to everyone go and have a look. Probably don't go there on mass, but if you want to go, you know, with two or three friends, or maybe for a romantic weekend, Ljubljana is fantastic. Fantastic. I've heard it is. Anyway, well, Steve, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you, as ever. And um, we'll also say hi to Mr. Charles Chicky Reeves, uh, again, producer, composer, uh, front house engineer, about to head off to uh, do the, a series of dates, 30-plus dates, I think, with OMD, right? Yeah, 30 with uh, OMD, and then we take a break, and then we start up again in February, March, April to, like, another 30-plus dates throughout the States. So, yeah, it's what? a busy touring season. Yeah, busy, busy well, that's great. Season. I mean, it's always good to have the work, right? It is. It's great. Uh, feast or famine. So uh, right now it's feast. So <laughs> just Excellent. make sure I take advantage of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, lovely to have you too. And uh, of course, uh, we have a last minute edition who just popped in there, uh, uh, taking a break from a session, I guess. Uh, Gaz Williams, gazwilliams.me, bass player, music technologist, producer, mastering guy, singer all of those things songwriters there's he look he's even got a plectrum handy how are you guys <laughs> that's my qualification yeah i'm good thanks uh yeah just a uh, very quick last minute joining in so thank you very much for having me i'm excited to be on today and also excited to be going to synth fest on saturday that's uh yeah. is that the second that's the second synth fest isn't it so um the second synth fest Mm. Yeah, well, we'll be that going. Uh, in really fact, cool. if, if, if you say hi to either, I've got, I've got us on the guest list, Gaz. So, uh, so we, we'll be <laughs> uh, we'll be there. Uh, hopefully, sort of sometime in the early to mid morning, uh, and we'll be there mm. all day. Staying, I'm staying up the night. I don't know if Gaz is probably as well. And uh, so we'll be out and about and around. And I'll be filming. Yeah. I'm we're trying a new rig, a new camera setup. So I'm the guinea pig, and I hope it's got a, my yeah. fingers across because I really, really want it to work. Anyway, but uh, yeah, Synthfest. Uh, if you didn't know, it's kind of organised in conjunction with Sound on Sound. I'm not sure if it's officially a Sound on Sound thing, but there's lots of exhibitors there. Lots I think of so. in fact, uh, Will, yeah. Gregory, and Ada Utley are going to be up there talking. Steve Levine, uh, Hannah Peel, mm. lots of other people as well. Okay. So it's going to be great fun. Yeah, it's part of the Sensoria Festival, which is a yeah. Sheffield city-based festival it's sort of, uh, that, uh, that goes over a few weeks. Um, so that's a really good festival, actually. They have loads of cool things on. So, yes, so it's cool having Synthfest. Um, I think it might be today that I think Nigel, who's part of running Sensoria, is doing a live performance of the original soundtrack of the Moomins, the, the, the animation uh, from uh, the, the, the kind of felty animation version yeah they were like sort of hippopotamuses on 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 two legs <laughs> yeah. looked a bit like but, that but it was a really nice kind of synthy soundtrack like a very kind of crusty organic sounding soundtrack very nice so um oh yeah. i didn't so know I that they, i have to they, check that out that, might, that might have been last night though or it's either either yesterday or today but um oh well well unfortunately you... we're oops sorry we're gonna we're gonna oh, miss that unfortunately 
Yeah, they use it. A, <laughs> sorry, my fault. They use it a wasp. I know they use it a wasp. I saw a, I saw a, a, a little photograph of uh, of the of the gear they were going to use, and I saw I saw a wasp that they were using. So that's a that's a cool little synth, the wasp, isn't it? It's got a really oh, it's got a dead cool sound. My friends, got yeah, one, definitely. You know, I, I, yeah. I think that was. I think there could be a. I think somebody needs to make some sort of a uh, synth name crossword puzzle with uh, obscure cu- clues because uh, that that could be that could be an interesting <laughs> way. Anyway, I, I, I completely digress. There's really no uh, <laughs> no reason for me to bring that up whatsoever. So let's uh, let's kick things off. Uh, let's see what uh, what the world has to offer us uh, this week. So we'll start with this one. I think this is a rather abstract introduction to uh, something. Uh, what was it about a minute long? I think we could probably play it all. Uh, this, uh, I mean, really classy and quite expensive uh, um, promotional video for. Well, what is it? Can you guess what it is yet, folks? It's not a kind of uh, three-dimensional holographic touch MIDI interface. It is, in fact, the Yamaha Genos, which um, periodically we do pieces about these sort of things because uh, it tends to be, you know, some of these these flagship arrangers type workstations are incredibly expensive and uh, at the sort of pinnacle of what you can pay here we go this is what it looks like it's coming it's coming it's going to form fully in a minute there it is genos that's it it's the new genos from yamaha which is the kind of flagship workstation it I mean, I, I hesitate to say that it's an arranger keyboard because it seems to be an awful lot more than that. And it's interesting because people tend to kind of poo-poo it a bit. But before that, it would have been the Tyros, uh, which, again, sort of really quite impressive auto accompaniment stuff. But the Genos al- uh, now allows kind of 16-track audio recording, sampling, vocal processing. I think it's got up to 60-part harmonies or 54-part harmonies, synth vocoding, you know, all these kind of AWM2 synth engine stuff that you find in the high-end motif stuff. And they're really pushing it as a songwriter tool it seems to me that's that seems to be the kind of uh the, the push of it and it does look like it could be i'm just trying to find a picture of it somewhere uh uh there must be a better picture of it than, yeah here we go here's what it looks like um big old thing faders lots of kind of uh, buttons to do various things a big touch screen and what have you has anyone ever played any of these things? Because I've heard, ty- you know, Tyros demos, and I've been. I thought actually, you know, you can get all sorts of expansion packs, and you know, while we might poo-poo at them, in terms of songwriting, they, they seem like they might have a, a, quite an interesting uh, approach. And there's lots of interviews with Nashville people, kind of saying, actually, this is great. I can just sit down at it. I don't have to worry about technology. I'll just make a song. I'm going to start with you, Steve Hillier, because we do periodically mm. do these, and uh, you've never spoken on the subject before. <laughs> The floor is yours. <laughs> um, well, I um, quite like uh, the sort of uh, arranger or workstation keyboards. Um, of course, they were uh, an idea that, were the, I suppose, came out towards the end of the 80s. And so that kind of hit, for me, the sweet spot when I was buying expensive synths for the first time. Um, so there's a sort of nostalgia for me. Plus, also, um, I can really appreciate where just walking up to a, a, a keyboard, switching it on, getting instant access to great piano sounds just works really well um, for a songwriter. So that's all fine. Um, having said that, it's really not something for me. It's It doesn't really, uh, the, the very concept of this machine doesn't really fit into um, how I work anymore. How, but I, when I'm working abroad, like um, at this weekend and often when I'm down in Spain, you see these workstation keyboards out pretty much everywhere they're in the the bars they're in the hotels there's performers who are doing you know one or two person shows with just that and maybe uh you know like a a singer um to do the singing um so there's definitely a role for them and they're certainly uh popular out there it does um it also kind of answers a, a quandary that i'm sort of dealing with at the moment i don't know whether the rest of you guys are experiencing this but with the uh, miniaturization of the technology that we have at the moment, um, it's, ter- it's certainly possible for me to turn up and do, just talking about DJing for a moment, to actually do a complete set on an iPhone, um, which has the benefit of me not having to la- uh, lug a laptop around, much like be attracted to these keyboards. They wouldn't have to lug a laptop around. But the dilemma that I have now is that I can take so little equipment with me and still do the job how little can you take before the promoter 
gets a bit <laughs> upset that you're just strolling in and you know charging whatever you're charging with just a phone you know it they could look at what you're doing and just think oh anyone could do that so i don't know it, it, it's certainly um it's a, a quandary that's going around in my head. But in the meantime, the uh, the workstation keyboards kind of answer the how do you not use a laptop live question really well, just not really for what I do. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I suppose you could take it to the other point. It's like, why even bother going? I mean, couldn't you just stream it? I mean, you know, essentially, you could do <laughs> yeah, that, that and have that, a camera that, feed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. then you wouldn't get to travel and stuff but then that defeats the point it's not really the experience for the end user then is it it's just sort of you know some bloke on the telly which doesn't or, or woman or whatever it doesn't necessarily make sense yeah I, I mean i suppose with these workstation keyboards they're very similar to the um in some ways you just go back 20 30 years when you would have um somebody playing on a, a sort of a yamaha organ not not a home organ yeah. but like a sort of professional level up it's that kind of thing and i think seeing the performer being completely involved in everything that you hear or at least almost everything that works well i think that's essential actually for the audience yeah hmm, interesting i don't know gas what do you think i mean there is something to be said for having something that you can just sit down at and kind of write a song or a tune without having to get into the whole IT business. I mean, this thing, though, I have to say, I just spotted the price again, and it's yeah, six thousand seven hundred and ninety nine quid uh, dollars. <laughs> it is not a cheap. I mean, but that's not yeah. uh, unusual in these high end kind of. Uh, no, I, no, that's true. Yeah, they, they, you know, they're claiming that it's kind of, um, you know, the quality of the of the, you know, it the rompler side of it to you know rival anything that's on vst format that sort of thing uh so you know the the polyphony and the um you know the, the sample rate i guess everything is is all top quality i guess um hmm i don't know there's something about them they're a bit vom worthy though aren't they i don't know there's something about them and i, I don't <laughs> want to be too i don't want to be too negative about it because i think if i had one i'd probably love it but there is something a bit on hip about them though isn't there there is something a little bit um cheese bag about them you know yeah, like well, it's the, music, a sense musical that you're, theater or just mm. i know what you mean <laughs> well in terms in, in terms of that sort of thing i suppose the thing is is also there's this sense that you know if there's any form of auto accompaniment then essentially what you're doing is is, is having the, the the kind of uh, the weight of a large global corporation behind your creative yeah. output or input which feels somehow wrong i mean not necessarily is because i mean there's no real difference mm. to to how we might use that with library sounds or whatever yeah i just yeah i mean i think it's this thing isn't it it just doesn't feel that it's like say maybe the sonic audiences kind of thing i don't know i i'm not quite sure quite why they make me feel as kind of sickly as they do. I don't know. Yeah, possibly it's a, there is a bit of painting by numbers with them. I mean, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's certainly that, not. Yeah, go, go. I know what you mean. It is interesting, though, that uh, um, they're pushing very hard. In fact, they've got interviews with five or six or seven kind of songwriters, uh, two kind of big Nashville songwriters who say, yeah, this is actually great for me. I mean, obviously, they're not going to make a record with it, but they can sketch out ideas. I know, Charles. Um, you ever get any uh, anybody showing up at you know at one of your gigs with something like this to kind of uh, drive anything? I mean, it, that would be Never. kind of a breakthrough, I suppose, in it, it, for 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 the makers of these kind of things, right? Yeah, I mean, I could see someone like Diane Warren <clears throat> using something like this. I mean, apparently, what she does, she does go into work at eight o'clock in the morning and sits at a piano and just starts writing and you know sketches out at least a song or more a day. But I I can't think of anybody who would use something like this. And I, I know if I had it, like, I mean, it was said earlier, oh, if, you know, if I had it, I'd probably love it. But, you know, if I had it, I'd be like, I spent 6000 on this thing. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's sure it's great, but, you know, I, I got it's a lot I have of money, so many things. That... It's a lot of money. And I have so many things that do the things that it does better. Oh, why I mean, is it so I, much I money? A, yeah, why is it so much money? Uh, Any idea? Uh, I can't um, see it. <laughs> well, I mean, the only the only thing I can think of in terms of a comparison is, uh, and this again is kind of outdated, really, is the called Chronos. You know, that that kind of does it all workstation, which has got all those massive synth engines in it, I mean, and that doesn't have the uh, at least I don't think it has the same multi tracking capabilities. It doesn't have the kind of auto. It has lots of arpeggiator mm. stuff in it, but it doesn't have the same sort of 
uh, technology behind that and the musical styles and all of those things. So I, I, I don't know why it's so expensive, but that was expensive, I suppose. And maybe it's because there's, they're not going to sell that many of them. And there's a lot of stuff. I mean, it hasn't got a weighted keyboard or it hasn't got any of that stuff, but it's got, I, yeah, I don't know. Is a pass is the answer to that, but it's a little it's bit like that, um, that gold Apple watch, you know, it's like, <laughs> that, it's like, it's like, who's going to buy this? You know, this technology that in three years is going to be outdated for $10,000. You know, it's it's. A, I guess they know their market, and if it's someone who's like a heavy hitter songwriter, it, you know, maybe they will they will use something like this. But it's sort of like it reminds me a little bit of when I first moved to the UK. I got introduced to the idea of like combination washer dryers because we don't really have those or didn't have those in the states. And you know, a combination washer dryer. I have yet to find one that either washes or dries particularly well. It just sort of does both, kind of half assed And uh, and I. I I can't imagine that this thing would, would be any better than that. You know, it's just gonna, it's gonna sort of record okay, and it's gonna you know string sounds and the company it's it's okay, you know. But unless you can completely update this thing almost daily, you know. I, yeah, I, I don't know. I think I think you're. I I think it, the mistake there is you're thinking about it in terms of final production. You're not you're not thinking about it in yeah. terms as a vehicle for writing material yeah. and that's what they're really pushing at it and i think i mean i would love to try one i mean th there's probably little point in me trying to review it because it would be there's so much in there it would take me weeks to kind of get to grips mm -hmm. with it and and point out it's heavy pluses too. and minuses it probably is heavy but, but i mean i think also... as an sorry steve I, 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 sorry i was just gonna say do you think it's, it's also uh, a possibility that this keyboard is aimed at the uh, home enthusiast uh, more than the professional uh, musician, you know, in the sense that you would rock, a home enthusiast, you know, maybe you know, a guy with a lot of or woman, of course, with a lot of spare money in her thirties, forties, fifties, or whatever, wants to get into music, can go to just one supplier, get one unit, and get everything within it without having to um, worry about uh, the IT uh, aspect of all of this. And so mm. consequently, they're a bit less price sensitive than we would be, let's say, because we, we're operating in a, in a different kind of market, I suppose. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, and I think from what you were saying, lots of people will gig with these things. I mean, you'd need to be fairly pro level to be able to re get a, recoup a return on a lot of that stuff. But I mean, mm. it, it is out there. I mean, it, it's it, it's all a, diff a different mind. It's interesting because it's kind of using the pinnacle of Yamaha's technology, but a, a sort of off the center of where it's usually used. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing, but, but they, they do. They, sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm cutting you off. I'm cutting That's you right. off. Um, I was just rambling. Um, <laughs> I was just wondering, though, I mean, because we're talking about it, like, based on previous experience of things like this, maybe, or, and I was just wondering, maybe it is an amazing thing, like, you know, to use and to have it all there and, uh, and I often moan about how I feel working with a computer can be a bit stullifying and I've, I'm trying to move away from using a computer for a lot of the things that I do because it's, uh, you know, that whole, that whole kind of computer way of working is, is a, is a sort of mindset. And, uh, I'm wondering if this thing though could actually be, if the preamps are really good in it, you know, if, if it's, if all of those things are really high quality whether it actually could actually be a really cool thing. Do we know, like, is this the synthesizer side of it? Does it have, like, analog modeling? Does it have, like, a proper fully editable synth in there? I couldn't tell you for sure, but it's the AWM oh. stereo sampling and AEM technology, so I think it's uh, similar to... I've got the spec sheet here. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, it. yeah, I mean, it's got a lot of those kind of components of the motif and the motif X that we've got the faders yeah. and you've got, but you've also got these ability to kind of... I mean, and I, you know, breaking it down, it's also got aspects of this sort of able. You know, if you've if you've created your parts in Ableton Live and you're pushing buttons to bring in different parts of the arrangement, and then you know, it's got all of those elements to it, but it's just not using those endpoints. It's got its own way of doing I, it. So yeah, it's I interesting. wonder if you could if you could make like filthy, dirty punk rock on it. I, I entirely possible. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure you can. I mean, from what I've heard, that the drum kit, you know, the drum sounds are actually pretty authentic more authentic than i've heard on those sort of things before if that's what you want so there's lots of kind of there's mm. tons they've put a load of money into videos there's loads of video it's worth checking out but it, i mean it is it is a bit of a novelty in the fact that it is so expensive so i suppose it's mm. it's going to be fairly rarefied audience but how many would you have to sell a hundred you know 200 mm. <laughs> if you sold a thousand 
Yeah, hell, hell yeah. That's that's a lot of money, isn't it? So I mean, I suppose it's not it's not that big a market, but it's it's a very valuable one at that price. Anyway, I just thought I wanted it, but but this did this did beg a sort of another question, which was so if you're writing. What because you know for for us for for me I've got a bu- bunch of synthesizers over there which I have to kind of fire up come up with some riffs and then and then I might think about a melody or about this or about that I don't know what I would go to if I was going to try and write a song at the moment and I wonder if how you all write if you're reaching for something to kind of go I want to you know put down some song part and be the quickest route to it I'll start with you again Steve because um, you know you presume yeah, you write uh- as well still. Mm. Um, well, I, I can tell you that the way I, I write now is really the same way I've always written, which is um, that I, no matter what it is, it always starts with me uh, playing on the piano. And I have a, a little, um, I don't know if you can see that. Maybe if I do this, I don't know. Um, there's a Yamaha CP70 there just uh, next to my shirt. <laughs> yeah, what I always do is, is um, I... Uh, set my uh, iPhone running and just essentially busk on the piano for a bit until something nice has come together. And it's only after I've got the, um, I suppose, the creative components together that I take anything to the machines. And then at that point, it's usually uh, Ableton Live and, and, and running clips. But it always starts on the piano just so that I don't have to worry about IT. And that's, you know, why I think that this observation that the Yamaha machine, removing the IT um, uh, you know, aspect of of, uh, of using an electronic mm. instrument it could be its real uh, raison d'être, as they say in Slovenia. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice Ljubljana re- reference there. Um, how about you, Charles? Where do you where do you start if you're writing? Almost always the OP one. Ah, I get yes, out my OP one because it's got a little speaker on it. it I, yeah, it's it's great. And then <clears throat> you know, I'll I'll actually even do like whole things, whole whole songs using just the OP1 and I, I'll track in parts into Ableton Live. And, um, you know, because it sounds great. It's very fast. Everything's very fast. And I'll go, I'll probably go through and, you know, replace things with like the Matrix Brute or, you know, all of those keyboards over there. But, um, but yeah, but generally I start with the OP1 because that's just so fast. It's the fastest thing. It's the, it, to me, it's the ideal workstation because it's got a battery that lasts for 16 hours so I can take it on a plane and I just run with that. <laughs> it's great. Interesting. So have all your guide vocals got the kind of uh, the loud hum of uh, uh, um, engine noise and AC in the background, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and the, well, the other, the one complaint with the OP1 is the um, USB connection is so close to the audio connection. So you get a constant like, you know, kind of noise on it. It's really annoying. Mm. So you have to unplug it or turn the power supply part of it off. It's kind of annoying. But ah, but I, I love the machine though. It's really a great machine. Right. So for you that works. Gas, what about you? I mean, I know you have lots of little micro kind of workstation and setups. I mean, do you find that that's where it works for you? Or if you're if you had to write a song for a specific purpose, you know, I don't know, say let's just say, you know, you were asked to write a song for a theatre production or a musical mm. or whatever, you know, where would you start? Uh, to be honest, uh, the thing that's really does it for me is using the chord track in Cubase. Uh, and for a number of reasons, really, um, I love the chord track. Here. I mean, it's so, so useful. But one of the reasons I love it is that when I push play and the timeline moves along, I can see all the chords coming. So if I'm playing guitar or bass, it's just a nice visual scrolling chord sequence coming along. And I find that really, really, really useful because, especially with MIDI parts, because you can then uh, come up with some parts and then you can try changing the chords and it, and it, and you can set all of the tracks to follow the rules of the chord tracks. So, you know, you can then substitute out different chords and get new in, and then all the MIDI parts will then change to reflect the chord change. And um, I love that because I I often start with something and end up with something very, very different. And it's a very, uh, it's a really cool. Um, um, so uh, chord sequences are the things I'm always looking for. And um, <laughs> actually, there's a chord bot meant to be arriving either today or tomorrow. Uh, the, that was the Kickstarter thing from 
Isla instruments. And I'm really looking forward to that because that looks like almost a little bit like a hardware version of the, the Cubase chord track, really. So I, I'm looking forward to that um, because uh, if I can get a nice sequence of chords, that just gets the creative juices flowing, really. I just um, uh, I love I love a chord sequence that is quite tricky to um, navigate. Your, pro and then... your prog's showing. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> but, uh, you know, finding, finding that melody that binds those changes together is, uh, right. is I find that quite inspiring. Yeah, okay so, that's yeah. an interesting one yeah I, i'm just thinking what i mean for me it, it, i'm just noodling on a synth usually and then it's just a question of kind of you know oh that sounds quite nice if i might remember it i then might figure out some other parts to go with it or whatever but i mean it's you know it's been years since i've actually written a song song but uh yeah cool i just wondered about that because i thought it was uh it, it would it would shed some some light on things so yeah the yamaha uh genos i think it's available soon obviously you know like i say it's it that that it's an expensive thing, but it might be just something that really, you know, if you're a songwriter and you need you need something that simplifies things, then why not? I mean, and I'm sure that technology will drop down to kind of lower price points as well. So, yeah, why not? Can I just say um, one, yeah, one extra yeah, thing yeah, in? So, about yes, it? sure. Um, it, the, um, something that uh, songwriters find is that um, it, it, there's a very different discipline between coming up with ideas and then recording them into a computer and editor, editing them and getting sounds together and that kind of thing. And so a lot of writers like to get as far as they can before they get into that kind of editing frame of mind, which is sort of what computers demand in a way. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, I can really see how this would appeal. The more I think about it, the more I, I can see how this could appeal to uh, writers, especially in that Nashville tradition. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Excellent. Okay, well, I think probably at this point we might just take a break and uh, have a little uh, interjection where we can uh, discuss, or, well, where we can have a message from our sponsors for the competition. Of course, is uh, Isotope RX6, uh, Isotope for a long term sponsor of the podcast. Uh, Isotope RX6 is, you know, I keep saying, but it's a kind of de facto standard. If you work with audio and you need to fix stuff, and this is pretty much it. There are so many ways of doing things. There's new new technology, deep bleed, deep breath, deep hum, deep click, ground hum, spectral repair. Uh, there's also uh, spectral deesser. There's uh, uh, additionally, I'm just trying to think what else there is. There's 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 so many more things. Uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, vocal cleaning tools, breath control, spectral DS, uh, mouth noise removal, deep plosive. Those are the sort of things that give us those sort of clean vocals. But just fixing stuff that's bust, you know, if you've got too much reverb on something, you can do reverb. There's all sorts of ways that you can save what did turn out to be a great vocal or a great take and still use it. If you use RX6, if you want to, uh, if you want to try it out, go to isotope.com forward slash RX6. There's a 10-day free demo that works with it. And, of course, we also have competition. Last week, we asked uh, for the hashtag, what was it, Audio Tools and RX6. And we have a winner from last week who is somebody called Arc Creativity. So ARK Creativity, at Arc Creativity, is our winner. Uh, and they tweeted and were... Um, Picked by the supercomputer uh, that we have uh, just it's out the back here. It's too big to be in this room and the noise is terrible. So uh, if you want to get in touch, uh, Creativity, uh, Isotope will furnish you with a copy of RX6. And of course, we do have another competition for this week. We've in fact got another copy of RX6 to give away. We're looking for the hashtag Wave Repair. So the hashtag Wave Repair and the hashtag RX6 to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. So you will need to use Twitter for this, but it's a very painless uh, exercise. So the hashtag Wave Repair pair and the hashtag rx6 to at sonic state at, at isotope inc good luck and thanks again uh, to isotope for providing the prize this week uh all right let's see what's our next topic um um i think we might go for uh yeah well let's, let's just do it in order this is the quiet art recorded to set a setup which is a kind of nifty little um it's like a scripting utility that allows you to uh, while you're recording in Pro Tools specifically, it allows you to kind of say, yeah, that's a good take. That's not such a good take. Uh, I'll fast forward it a bit because this is just the installation process. And let's see if I can find it here. So while you're recording, you just say, yep, yeah, no, yep, yeah, no. And you could say stuff about it and you create kind of a playlist and then you can apply that playlist. It cuts the regions up. If there was a bit in there that you didn't like, chop it out and it leaves it all there on the timeline. And it's, it just seems like quite a nifty tool. It's from the people, uh, Quiet Arts, who did the uh, Wave Rider plugin, which is actually also very p uh, popular, which is like a Dynamics 
or volume processor to incoming volume. And um, it is a bit pricey, 99, but it's very specific. And, uh, but this, A, you know, what do you do, Charles, when you have a vocalist in and you're looping over and over and over again? Because for me, I do it so rarely, I forget. I don't have a workflow for making notes. And I suddenly think, oh, I need to grab a pencil and, and write stuff down so I can remember. Because <clears> listening back, you know, sometimes you don't hear the same thing again. How do you do with that? Yeah, I uh, just take copious notes. I have a, uh, an iPad Pro and an Apple Pencil, and I just take notes in that constantly. Um, yeah, this this thing seems kind of cool, but I, I, it would be more for people doing voiceovers and doing that yeah. sort of stuff. I, I am curious, like it, so, like you hear, so you hear it, and then you decide if a take is good, and then you mark it. But how does it know where the beginning of that particular take is? It for, is it like from the last one or? I didn't. I couldn't quite figure I'm, that out. I'm not sure if it how it works, whether it's in loop or it's in constant um, record. Because I think it's once you start recording, rather than uh, so you'd be in cycle or in a continuous. But they, recording, they seem think, to but be yeah. like it seemed to be like one audio file, and then as it was going along, the person was marking a good or a bad take and good back, and then it, as soon as you finished recording, it would go through and chop it up. But I'm I'm sort of thinking like, well, how does it know where the person started talking? And, and you can't judge if something's going to be good or bad before it. So you have to – I couldn't quite figure out how it works. Uh, well, you hit, but, well <clears throat> it, you hit the record button in the app itself, and that starts the yeah. recording process. So that's how it knows where the recording starts, if you see what I mean. Well, I mean, like, how does it know where that particular – like, it, it, they were doing all, like, one take in – or, or several takes in one audio file. So how does it yeah, know okay. where – you know, so I, I couldn't quite figure that out. But I think it would be – it would probably be pretty cool for – someone who's like really pressed for time on that sort of thing. I've never been pressed for time on that sort of thing. I mean, uh, and I, I'm very, I do take lots of notes, but I also, I'm very, uh, maybe mercenary isn't the right word, but I, I make decisions very fast. I commit very fast. And, yeah, right. and I, I just, I'm like, you know, this is the one we're going with that one. Uh, I, and I don't want 10 to choose from. And I also limit the number of times that someone, can do it because if they don't if they don't get it in like five takes they're probably not gonna get it you know that generally speaking on voiceover stuff um then i'll have them work through the part until they're until they get get the i mean i'm not i'm not a jerk in the studio it's just that i'm just i like to be very de decisive really fast um yeah. but yeah, well, i no, guess I it would that. be pretty cool but I, I i i wouldn't use something like that but it, it is pretty cool yeah okay uh steve <laughs> You presumably record yeah, I, vocalists I, quite regularly, and you know, or yourself. Yeah, or whatever. that's right. And I, I agree with uh, what Charles was saying there about this being, um, I think, mainly useful uh, for voiceovers. It, the voiceovers was something that I did uh, a long time ago for uh, for a, a little while, and um, anything that you can do to speed up the editing process there is a good idea because everyone's working on the, on the clock. Which, and I know it's a similar thing in the studio, but it's not quite the same. Um, in terms of uh, you know, helping out with recording vocalists. I can see how this would be useful, but again, I'd, I'd work in a similar way to Charles, as in I'd much rather, rather than making up a, a list of 20 vocal takes, which help for the producer and also for the vocalist, to try and get as high a quality uh, recordings and takes as I can. You know, after about five or six goes, then you're as Charles says, you're probably not going to get it. So anything that is um, uh, a great take in my uh, sort of process, I, I delete. Rather than going through and, and using an automated process like this, I would sooner delete it and just zone in on the takes that, um, that I thought were good. And so my process is, rather than uh, looping around a chorus and getting you know uh, six or seven takes in one go. I'd much rather, I suppose, in a way, be a bit more. I am, in fact, old school by starting at the start and getting the vocalist to sing through to the end. And if overall that sounded quite good, I'd much so, oh, you, uh, I'm not sure about this take. Color. This take hasn't worked out. Sorry, you went a bit robotic there. There was a bit of buffering, but I think I got the gist of what you were saying there. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that, Steve. Um, um, no worries. But, but uh, um, Gaz, how about uh, how do you do it? Do you just kind of do you, do you follow the same principle, which is if it didn't happen, it's not going to happen? Or well, funnily enough, that's what I've been doing in the session today is vocal editing. And uh, when we were doing the takes, we were taking about uh, three or four passes at each part um and coming back to it 
today to do the editing and we would listen to it in phrases if the phrase is good move on to the next phrase if the phrase isn't you know if there's something wrong or something not quite tonally right or something just switch it through and i mean you know using comp comping tools uh and we do such a lot of this so we're very fast and reasonably efficient at it um and then uh make one composite then and then use that composite to edit specifically within it uh so it's a pretty fast process so i'm not sure that this would work for me either however uh, <laughs> it's interesting i'd come up with a very similar idea i, I don't remember do you remember me banging on about my emotional editing idea a few years ago which is basically a very similar thing you know yes or no yes or no yes or no which is exactly like what this has got this uses your cursor keys doesn't it to either go yeah arrow yes, keys left or right no, i think arrow, yeah. right okay yeah um so i th there is i mean and i think a quite a good point is um if you've got like a really good performer and it's not a question of whether something is right or wrong and you've got a bunch of takes that you have to assess i mean this is what my emotional editing was i was kind of interested in seeing if you could find a way where you could let you know you act react to what you're listening to emotionally and not having to engage with the technical side of things so that's why i think this is quite good breaking that down to just whether you know yes or no um so you literally just completely listen and feel and that because you know like as i say if you're working with a really good singer and two you know you've got a bunch of takes to choose from uh and they're they're not kind of incorrect in any way it's just what they you make you feel to. like yeah yes exactly so you know it's just uh, uh and it is quite hard to lose um you know just to to lose perspective um especially if you are in that editing mode working fast um like so today for instance i'm working with somebody else and i'm literally just the editor and he's got he's given me the guidance and i'm just doing the i'm being like the software really you know i'm being the uh i'm not having to make the operator yeah yeah but i do find when i'm working on my own I do lose that emotional um, connectivity. So I definitely think they're definitely onto something with this. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I suppose the trick is recognizing, as uh, Chris Head says in the chat room, uh, a live one take versus a studio version of the song, a life has totally gone from a track. And it's a question of recognizing that point at which mm. I like the idea of uh, maybe you should take the X factor approach and just have like this sort of traffic light system and a really big button that's sort of like very clear, <laughs> that's very visible to the singer as they're doing it. So you can make them feel really kind of like, yes, no, yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether that would work for some singers. They might be a bit too emotionally fragile for that. But, you know, th th there's there's got to be something in that perhaps, you know. Maybe a put, put on a Simon Cowell mask or something. Or that would probably be Ooh. really bad. A really bad idea. Ooh. Perhaps we won't do that at all. No, let's forget yeah. about that. Just forget I said that. Scrub. We scrub <laughs> that from the edit. Yeah. That, my uh, my producer says that, yes, that's possible. Um, that take was definitely a, a big resounding thumbs down. Yeah. Um, or maybe you know, in the world of social media, we could just stream the whole thing live and just see how many likes you get on Facebook or Hearts or whatever, you know. And then so everybody, you could get a cloud decision based on it. Who knows? <laughs> cloud. That's take. like that P PJ Harvey thing where she did the the recording session uh, live, or she did it in front of like in this glassed in area over in. I think it's Somerset House or something, and uh, all the people could just like sit around and watch from outside of this soundproof glass booth, just watch her as she's recording an album of hers. It's like, yeah, and they, like yeah, she's doing takes. There's speakers outside, and, be, and people could be like, you know, just giving her the thumbs up or thumbs down. Wow. Oh, that would be so uncomfortable. That would be well, it's so interesting painful. though. But it, I mean, it's interesting in this world of crowdfunding, the concept of of you know, say a band here playing a song three or four times and the amount of kind of you know the amount of feedback you get which version do you like okay therefore they they then become invested in that so therefore you've got mm. well however many people who might go yeah i i i, I was part of that decision i'm going to buy that now because i feel like i had a, an input to it you know it's a kind of interesting mm. uh, concept though not one that perhaps works at the composition stage it would have to be it would yeah. be more of a mm. sort of pro session person who could just go what about this way or what about that way or what about whatever yeah <laughs> 
there is there is there is a scenario <laughs> come on, sorry no you no no i just said there's a spinal tap reference in there somewhere about like janine going yeah listen to his ideas i said oh, that <laughs> yeah, was, yeah. you know <laughs> so anyway go ahead guys sorry <laughs> um, there is that role that diplomatic role that you have to take as a producer if you're working with a band when you're doing takes and you're looking for a master take that um one person's experience of it like for instance someone might have made a couple of mistakes so they taint they've got that that those mistakes have tainted, tainted that yeah take so they kind of so they're not into that take because they've got a personal kind of grievance with it uh whereas for another musician they might have you know this you know they may have made mistakes on other takes so um there is that thing of like it is sometimes tricky to uh work out what is the best take because any mistake pretty much can be fixed so um keeping the you know that's why again that's where i'm talking about this kind of emotional thing what is uh the emotional kind of value how does it make you feel um there is a little i mean it's going slightly off topic but it's quite an interesting technique that i'd read about in the book uh there's that wonderful book called mixing with your mind i don't know if, if any of you know this book it's written by um chap called Stav. He's an Australian guy who worked for George Martin. And um, and uh, I've modified his technique a little bit. And and this technique is if you've got a bunch of takes, you've got the band playing a bunch of takes, for instance, and you're trying to work out which is the best take to go as the master performance, you know, given that any, ed, any mistakes can be fixed. So you for the take with the best feel. And this is especially good technique if this is non click track based material. Um, and what you do is you've got to find something heavy. He recommends um, phone books, but phone books just don't really exist anymore, do they? And, you know, Yellow Pages is now bitten the dust. So what I found it's really useful to do this technique with uh, the cushion pop, the bottom part of a, a cushion of a settee or something. <laughs> I had a whole band doing it once. It was so funny. So everyone's holding these cushions. And what you do is you play the takes and you've got to swing the cushion in time with the performance and um and what happens there is you get very into the physical action of, of swinging the cushion and it's a way of kind of gauging what feels good and like if you if if the track or this this is a good way as well of working out tempo you know you kind of shake this your know, whole swing in this cushion and then the one that you enjoy swinging the cushion to most then that gives you an indication of um, whether to go with that or not. It sounds a bit mad, but uh, in this You're one right, case, it does, we did yeah. it. <laughs> well, we did it. We did it. I, I've done it. I've done it numerous times. And in this one case, we'd done a take with a click track, and we'd done a click and a take without a click track. A very good musician, so there wasn't any sort of particular timing uh, problems with it at all. I had the whole band swinging these cushions. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, and everybody enjoyed swinging the cushion to the non-click track rather than the click track version um they just felt that it just felt nicer and it's a crazy idea but it's just that way that it takes you it it just focuses you, you focus on something else a bit yeah okay yeah and, and let's just shake it and it does sound crazy but honestly if you try it it's it's a really interesting thing and it's fun as well which is always worth doing <laughs> Wow. Okay. Well, there's something there's something new for you that right there. But anyway, this is the Nifty recording. This is uh, the what are they called? They are called. Um, oh gosh, I've just scrolled. Quiet Art Re Recorder. It's called. Okay. Um, I think I might just uh, flip in a little bit of uh, more advertising from us, <clears throat> which is uh, here's the Wave Junction Max for Live Synthesizer. Two oscillators, including Wave Table. Uh, three multi-mode filters. <clears throat> Excuse me. Five envelopes, five LFOs, a uh, 12 slot modulation matrix, lots of different modes in those oscillators as well. So you can get a whole bunch of sort of starting tones. Uh, runs, as I say, uh, in, on the Max for Live at Ableton. You can buy it directly from us, and we're offering a 20% discount. <clears throat> All you got to do is go to uh, use the, the code WJTalk17 at bit.ly slash wave junction. So bit.ly slash wave junction, use the code WJTalk17, you get 20% off of what is already a very reasonably priced product. So uh, that's that ad done as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, let's see what we'll do next. I think uh, let's try this one. 
This is the... Uh, it's not that new, but it's uh, the Sandman Pro uh, delay via Plugin Alliance, unfiltered audio, and it's a really interesting delay. It's got various different models in it, pitch mode, stereo mode, tape mode, but it's also got these really powerful modulation possibilities. So you can modulate multiple parameters. We get forward a little bit. I'll fast forward it a little bit and see if we can uh, find where the os where the modulator's coming. Yeah, here we go. So you can put LFOs in and then start modulating various parameters. And one thing I particularly liked was uh, the diffuse feature as well, which sort of softens all the delays and it turns it more into sort of like a reverb sort of thing. Now, I don't know whether... Uh, I, I, I did see a comment from Ty. He said, yeah, he's had it for a while. thought it was great. And uh, Chicky, you're, you were the guy who kind of like brought this to notice. So uh, have you checked it out? Yeah, I love it. It's great. It really is great for mangling audio in really interesting musical ways. Um, <clears throat> the that video that you just had, I haven't seen, but I saw, I saw the video that they had on YouTube that doesn't have Ableton the, in the back. The tutorial, just, yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, and it's it's great. I mean, you can just do so many things I never thought about doing with delays. And I'm thinking about using using this live actually uh, as a front of house delay <clears throat> i love stuff like this yeah it's like a it, it's like if you can imagine like break tweaker and echo melt do you remember echo melt i think you guys talked about it i'm not sure if there. i do like, know that one echo melt it's it's a echo melt is a is a really inexpensive uh delay that sounds fantastic and it's got like a, a vhs snag sort of filter thing on it um, so it, it really does have very convincing tape based delay <clears throat> effects on it. It's, it's great. I use it. I use it a lot. Um, yeah. And Is it's like, it? a, uh, $45. I, I can't quite yeah, make four, out 49 there. bucks. Yeah, it was, it was like 20 bucks. And so maybe they'll still do a deal, but, uh, but so this, this, this one that we're talking about though, is that Sandman is like a, a mixture of great tweaker and echo melt. And then a bunch of cool stuff on top of that. I mean, it's just, it's really strange what it does. And, and I love it. Absolutely love it. Um, what it does to drum things and just, oh God, it's just so, it's so cool. It's so cool. Um, and it was, I, I actually found out about it uh, yesterday from, from Caitlin, who does some Sonic Talk stuff. Ah, um, Katie, uh, Katie Kilobyte in yeah, the chat room, right? Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so she, yeah, she told me about it. And uh, so I, I, while I was talking to her, I was sort of checking out the video. And as soon as I got got off the message board with her, I just immediately bought it. And I love it. Absolutely love it. It's fantastic. Excellent. <laughs> uh, Ty's right. Ty's right. It's great. It really is great. I love sound design tools like that. Uh, you know, it's sort of like like with reverbs and stuff like that. Like, I love Valhalla. I love um, uh, what, uh, adaptive verb, you know, things like that. Any, anything that's like more sound design than just reverb or delay or something like that, but anything that just does really crazy soundscapes that yeah. um, that are very usable, musically speaking. Oh, neat. Uh, Steve, uh, is it a go-to kind of, what do you go to when you're looking for uh, delay plugins? I mean, is this sort of thing that, you, do you prefer the straight stuff or do you go for a sound or how, how are you? It, it really does depend on what the job is. Um, I can, it's a sound design thing. Um, the delay plugin I'm using all the time now is object delay from applied mm. acoustic systems um and that's very different to any other delay that i've ever uh, used in that the the audio signal goes through a kind of model of a of a membrane or a drum uh, or a plate before it hits the delay line and so you it's very difficult actually to get sort of standard delay sounds unless you just switch off all the modeling but with the modeling there you can create some incredible sounds um and i would thoroughly recommend it quite frankly in fact i would i would thoroughly recommend pretty much everything from applied acoustic systems i, I use it i use their stuff all the time um so that's my go-to delay for sound design uh beyond that um if i'm just looking for a, a standard delay um i find that the stereo delay in, in logic basically gets the job done quite frankly yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that you've got the filtering and the, the beat divisions and the free yeah. stuff. Yeah, this one looks pretty good. And it's actually. also very the, uh, sorry. 
Um, uh, sorry, I was going to say also it's very easy to uh, automate, obviously, within Logic with a stereo delay. So, yeah. Um, but, I, but, but as I said before, object delay is just fantastic. I'd recommend it to everybody who likes, um, you know, WAD. WAD? That's not a word, is it? Mad not and quite. wacky <laughs> things. Yeah. That'll, that'll, that'll be close. WAD. <laughs> Gaz, how about you? I mean, I, I'm guessing, you know, you because you've got quite a lot of pedals and stuff. I mean, this looks really cool, actually. It's sort of got a bit of a, a eventide vibe about it because you could do the pitch shifting and mm. the delay stuff, so you can get some really wacky sounds. Well, funnily enough, I've only just become really aware of this company with uh, a delay that they do, a, like they do one um, called... Uh, it's called Instant Delay, which I think is like... Uh, is it maybe like a cut down version of this one or certainly oh no no they do a sandman and a sandman pro don't they i think yeah, um, yeah that's right but the uh the instant delay uh to be honest i'd, I'd borrowed the um the the roly light light block light pad block uh from sonic and you're very lucky that i didn't throw them in a bin i hated them so much but the only thing i i liked with them oh god i oh Anyway, sorry, I won't get going on that. <laughs> um, but they, you could, you can get a, the uh, instant delay. You can use with a light pad block. It's got, uh, it's got a, a special mode for it, um, and that's actually quite cool. And you can kind of wire. They use like a kind of uh, like a modular type sort of wiring system, and you can wire up the different axis of the light pad block to different parts of the delay. And was unquestionably the best use I found of the uh, the light pad block. Um, and I discovered that the delay was incredible for not glitching and just changing the the, the delay times without any of the weirdness. Um, it was a really nice delay. So whatever algorithms they're using, I'm very very interested to try out this Sandman. But as for my default delay, uh, I'm a big fan of Replica by Native Instruments. I really love that delay. It's um, it's just, I don't know, it's just got like a kind of a weight to it almost. I don't know, I can't quite put my finger on what I like about it, but um, I always feel it's just got lovely presence in a mix or just gives a real sense of, I don't know, it's quite strange. Um, but there yeah. That's what yeah. that looks like. Plucker, it's great. It's really cool. It's there's like three main modes on it, and it's quite easy to navigate around. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's good. Replica, highly rate that uh, one. Excellent. Well, okay, you want to check out the uh, unfiltered, it's unfiltered audio uh, Sandman Pro, and that's it. Seems like they're all around about ninety nine bucks for these kind of highly featured delays. So uh, yeah, well worth checking out, and something that's a, a little bit more creative than your average delay with all of the other stuff going on in it. Um, okay, right. Uh, time for another. Kind of got a, another. I'm going to go with this one because uh, we're we're running a little short of time. So I wanted to. Uh, I, we could always do. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go with this one at the moment because this is the new TC Electronic hardware. This is very effectsy to, uh, uh, topics, but that's just the way it's worked out. This is the new hardware, stereo hardware effect from TC Electronic. This is the uh, MX100, I think it's called. And it's just got a bunch of algorithms in it, stereo in, stereo out, a nice tap tempo feature on there, which I think is absolutely essential for any kind of delay, because in a live situation, you want to be able to dial that in and what have you. But it just made me think, I mean, hardware effects, it's like they've kind of fallen off a cliff. We just don't see them very often, really, anymore, because we've got all of this choice to choose from. And I don't, I don't know if I've got any now, because obviously most digital desks have got them in uh, effects in as well. And I just wondered what... Uh, what well, there's two questions here. A, this is pretty cool. It's 99 bucks, so it's the same price as the delay plugins, but it's actually a piece of stereo hardware, which I guess if you need a hardware effect, you know, that's kind of a pretty cool way to go. And also, um, what it is that my first... I'm just trying to think what my first hardware effects was as well, you know. So, Gaz, 99 bucks, TC Electronic. Obviously, Ooh. Behringer own TC Electronic. Amazing. They own all the algorithms. I mean, it's a pretty no-brainer if you're looking for external hardware and stereo as well, right? Yes, there we are, there we are, and lots of decent algorithms and a very simple, very simple interface. And nice to see a dry wet mix on the on the front panel too. Uh, so, I mean, obviously you're not going to get too tweaky with it because you've only got the one edit knob. 
uh, I think, and there's like a button, yeah. isn't there, for tap tempo. So it's like it's a simple, simple, simple little device. But um, those TC algorithms are going to be lovely. Nine, yeah, I, I think I probably will get one of these, you know, because really, really helpful little box to have around. I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I think I know quite a few of the algorithms from other TC units that I've had, and uh, just. Yeah, wow. Not, so 99 bucks. I mean, what will that be? Britain? Probably 99 quid, quid I'd imagine. Yeah, maybe maybe 99 reckon. quid. Yeah. Uh, mm. But, so, but uh, even still, 99 quid. And the other question is, uh, what was the first effects unit you bought that's not a pedal? Uh, it, well, it, uh, could Boss. Be a pedal. it could be a pedal. Boss SE50. Oh, yeah, um, I remember that. That had a vocoder, wicked yeah. vocoder in it, didn't it? Uh, it was great. Um, but then... It, it's it got superseded by the se 70 and my friend had one of them and i was really dead jealous about it because it had a it had a little spinny data wheel rather than having to sort of press to yeah the it was a nightmare to, to program it was like that <laughs> yeah but the se 70 hours. actually i thought was an amazing little box uh i really liked that uh, i thought that was a classic um but yeah i think se 50 was one of the first ones i had uh and that had a really good sound quality for its time i think um I think they reasonably sought after. I think the SC70 is now anyway. But um, yeah, yeah, good, good thing. If I, if I remember algorithms. correctly, it had some. Uh, excuse me. If I remember correctly, it had some really extreme and amazing phases. There was a step phaser, so you could actually have this kind of really unusual. It, it, it had a lot of, and it, I think it was dual effects. Okay, yeah, Steve. What about you then? Uh, a ninety nine bucks for hardware effects. I mean, hard to argue with, right? It it, it looks really nice, and I can imagine that. Uh, Somebody who's got like a, an old school analog synth, but wants to play it live without having to take around, you know, a laptop or anything, they um, they could use this for delay. Just plug it in and forget about it. Don't have to, you know, worry about any kind of IT concerns. And um, mm -hmm. I think it looks really good for that, particularly at this price. I mean, ninety nine dollars is is a, a, a very low price. Although well, once you've converted it to pounds, that's about a grand, isn't it? But yeah, um, getting that way. I think it's. Uh, yeah. Um, no, I, I really like. I really like um, the. Uh, this would be very useful, I think, for maybe me actually in a in a live situation. But we were just asking there about um, what was the first uh, effects unit that you bought that wasn't a pedal, and I have it right here. I don't know if you can see that, but that's a Yamaha SPX ninety. Oh, ah, classic. Of course. Yeah. There we go. It's not much. Um, you can't really I see still much on it. Yeah. Do you still use it? No, I'm, well, it's it's slightly and sounds like the eighties, quite frankly. Um, what did you use it uh, for it, mostly? Um, the symphonic setting in it. It's got a uh, a symbol kind of chorus sound, which I haven't found anywhere else, quite frankly. It mm. sounds really uh, lush, and I don't want to call it analog because it's not, but it's just got that sort of warmth that um you would expect to find in a in a analog chorus pedal but it's not analog also the other thing that works really well on this the um uh gated kind of and reverse reverb sounds yeah. that don't sound uh realistic at all they don't sound like anything real but if you put drums through it particularly you get this lovely grainy kind of sucking reverb sound that um i know that my bloody time used on their song uh soon from the loveless album. and so if you want to know what the spx 90 sounds like just listen to the first 10 seconds of soon and it's it's terrific Excellent. I remember SPX90 always used to be something I would use live a lot. And uh, there was a trick, if I remember correctly, you'd select the gate reverb, but you'd open the gate right up so that there was no gating going on. And then the snare going into that would be you know, quite a reasonable sound. I think they had a Rev 5 there as well, but uh, at the club I used to work at. But yeah, I mean, classic. An absolute classic. I know, Charles. I mean, you do a lot of front of house sound. I mean, as you say, you use a lot of that in the box really now, though, don't you? No. Uh, oh. <laughs> you know what I do live? I, I have a, yeah, uh, live, <clears throat> I carry, my front house rig is a, uh, the Apollo 8 with the 8 ends and, eight, and 10 outs. And I use the 8 ends as from you know, the 8 aux ends from the console and then just to stereo out for my effects returns. So I run uh, three instances of reverb, one for splash, one for vocal and a plate for some additional vocal stuff. 
three instances of of echo and two instances of stereo spreaders um and i i i unless i unless i have to i try not to use the effects inside consoles because I, I like to trigger things i have a i'm pointing at it because i'm i'm sitting right in front of it i i have a um the little akai lpd8 yeah it's like the little pad thing and i i triggered the effects with the with the pad so i, I do, during the show i'm doing lots of cues and so i'm and oh, well, so I, when I'm you hit the button, the, the the send is on. Effectively, is that is that what you mean? Yeah, and in fact, is hard. The harder I hit it, the more the send is on. It goes up to zero if I do 127 velocity. Um, so my I, I try to hit it as hard as I can. But it's but like I want splashes on the fourth snare of the phrase, and you know, leading into a chorus or something like that, or echo certain words. Um, but I the the only. Aside from that, I mean that's sort of semi hardware. The only thing I really use that's like proper hardware is I use a Chaos Pad three, which I use for delays. I use the tape delay in that, so I'll, I'll do that to strengthen like held out vocal lines and stuff. Um, but to answer your question about the first stuff I first one I ever bought, first one I ever bought was an SPX fifty or a fifty D, I think it was called, which was a scaled down version of the SPX ninety. Uh, but I at this on the same day, I bought. Uh, an, an Alesis quadriverb, no, not uh -huh. quadriverb, midi, midi verb, and I bought an Effectron three, and I bought all three of those new, which wow. just gave away my age. In case one, anybody wants to, you know, know what? I, I, just look I was gonna because I was gonna bring <laughs> up the midi verb because my I think my my first studio effect or what what it was supposed to be was in fact uh, the Alesis midi verb, but it didn't have a power supply. I can't remember where I bought it from, and uh, it's easy to forget. But this was and i hate to use the phrase it was a game changer because it was the that level of the, it was the first as far as i recall it was pre spx even it was the most affordable yeah. multi effects unit that you could get i mean and it was it was because alesis kind of pioneered the surface mount technology as well they were making them far more affordable than anybody else i remember because i had to buy a new power supply for it and the only way i could plug it in was actually to poke the pins in i think i blew it up in the end so it didn't actually ever <laughs> Uh, so, but then I graduated to a MIDI Verb 2, uh, which has, uh, again, some really beautiful, uh, very wide, I've probably talked about this, there like was some bloom, bit, I think. bloom settings in there, which I think was 88 or uh, EFX or 99 or so. I can't remember the, the effects numbers, but there were some really massive sound effects in there. But interesting though that uh, the hardware effects still do have a purpose and like like we all say you know 99 bucks is hard to beat and it's not something that people buy very often because i say you know yeah. I, if i i don't i mean a loads of synths have effects built in on them anyway i mean i know a lot of people use things like the blue sky and all of that kind of the big uh, blue sky big sky blue sky and you know those kind of de and the uh, eventide h9 you know that's where they tend to go for the really expensive massive sounding algorithms but to do that live not so many people are using at least as much to my knowledge maybe more now are using real-time effects processing from the computer using hardware inputs and then having you know maybe valhalla or whatever it may be i suppose it's just an extension of that and so it's gone into you know if it's just one box that does it all then you're kind of you're kind of on the win there so nice to see that yeah. it's still there mm -hmm. Um, okay, what's the time? It's five o'clock. Does anybody feel particularly strongly about any of the other topics that uh, they, uh, perhaps the only reason they came on the show <laughs> for that that I haven't gone yet? Because we've we've got the uh, I don't know. There's the. Did you see the Nigel Stanford thing that uh, that came out? I was just. Should I? Should I? That was pretty cool. Okay, well, let's do a little bit of that then, because there's a couple of things about this that are really interesting. So this is Nigel Stanford. You might remember him. He did uh, cymatics. Uh, which was a really great video. It's about, I think we talked about it on the show some time ago. This is his latest video, Automatica. And it's basically, I mean, what is astonishing about this? I mean, you'll see, it's basically robot. So here we go. I won't play it all because I'll probably get busted by the YouTube police. I think what's this one that he's got playing now? I think it's uh, oh, it's a bit of piano. I think we have next. And it just goes on and on. And there's more of these. There's a drummer in it, and they're all, as far as I can tell, it's all for real. And 
A, it's an amazing concept. I mean, really kind of uh, quite impressive concept for a video. And he's a very interesting fellow. He's, I think he's self got his own record company so he does his own thing and he's got very strong roots in sort of scientific uh research and it's certainly cymatics and and space photography and stuff he's just a really interesting bloke uh, um gaz I'm, I'm guessing this mm. might be something that you thought was pretty cool or maybe yeah. you didn't well i initially i was like wow and i was just about to share it and then i just started getting suspicious that it was all like a little bit faked um so i'm not I'm not sure. I mean, it, I mean, you can see the things really looking like they're playing, but um, I, I wondered. I don't know how. There is a making. Is there is a making of video where he's he, uh, he's kind of got drum kits playing, and you know the bass. He's got the bass thing happening, and he's he was kind mm -hmm. of just making sure that you know obviously the robots don't destroy all of the, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All of the stuff. But, which is funny because at the end of the video, the robots do actually just destroy everything, and that's for real as well. But uh, uh, so but, you do I mean, get the, the story the, in the payoff. Are the, are the robots kind of miming it? The parts, though. I mean, that's the thing. Well, it's sort of. Uh, yeah, I would assume so because, of, mm. well, but I don't know that for sure. That's a that's mm. a fair question. Is I mean, his cymatics video was fantastic as well. And this is a brilliant video as well, worth watching for sure. But I mean, you know, it, it just, it was one of those things was like, are we meant to be watching something which is, um, you know, like a, that amazing orchestron thing that um, Pat Matheny was doing where he had. Almost, well, it was actually mechanical, right? Yeah. 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 <clears throat> as opposed to this sort of looking like, you know, I mean, it's quite just a, I mean, it is really a pop video at the end of the day, isn't it? Yeah, you know, uh, albeit a very good one and very, uh, yeah, and the synchronizing of everything looks like it's all being played. So, yeah, yeah, don't know. Yeah, good. Really I, good. I can't really imagine. Yeah. I mean, the. I can't imagine how much those robots cost. So whether or not they had mm. that many of them in one place or not, because it, it was done in yeah. conjunction with the right. manufacturers of the robots. So that's fair enough. I know, Steve, can you imagine going to a record company this in this day and age and saying, I've got a great idea for a video. It'll only cost. I, I mean, I can't imagine what that must have cost to make it even in just man hours, let alone the space <laughs> hire, the, the kind of robot hire, the operate, you know, all of that stuff. That's the thing that I was kind of most impressed by the resources um, that went into this. I, I think that there would be a lot of questions to be asked, <laughs> mainly from the A and R team. <laughs> um, and I think actually, you know, in the end, the, the the video is actually it's really it's interesting and it's fun, but it, it leaves me a little bit cold. You know, um, if you go into old stately homes in the UK, uh, you'll sometimes find that the uh, the owner of the houses had an automaton. You know, it's like a yeah, like a robot yeah, yeah, yeah. from the yeah. Victorian age, and it would do stuff. There was there was one up in Northumberland when I lived in the northeast, where there was a, an automaton swan. And once you got over the kind of spectacle of seeing a machine doing something apparently organic, it just didn't really um, well, it didn't move me anyway. Um, so yeah, I think you know, kudos to the, the video maker, and, and it is certainly impressive. But um, I I don't think I can afford this, Nick. I, you know. <laughs> fair enough uh, you kind yeah. of would like to say you can buy buy the track or uh hd version of the the video which by all accounts is you know is well worth like six bucks or something like that i know chicky you, would you feel comfortable if you were involved in a live show where the robots were basically that involved I and mean, when you consider the amount of sort of raw latent power that those things have you know they're doing these very micro movements and it's all yeah. very pretty but then you know one accidental sweep of the arm and it's like decapitation <laughs> yeah i i read i was reading up on the robots the um apparently they're accurate their movements are accurate to within i think it's 0 0.03 of a millimeter Jeez. that's how accurate wow yeah that's incredible so it must be accuracy. incredibly heavy <laughs> yeah not bend. And, and and yeah this was done in conjunction with them so i imagine that you know the the maker of the robots see this as a great i mean it is a great promo for 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 the robots that are going to take all of our jobs and uh enslave us but um the but you know this reminds me of the the square pressure video do you see that square pressure video uh, i think it came out about two years ago it was a live performance and everything was being played by mechanized devices the the bass the drums everything was being being played and, oh yeah uh, yeah i do i think i do remember that, was, that yeah it was i mean I find Square Pusher's music to be interesting for about five minutes, and then I can't listen to any more of it because it just feels so sensory overloaded. But 
but uh but it, it it was it was truly amazing and you know this this is very similar to that although i think the the uh, sophistication of the robot or the robots i should say is obviously much higher on this um yeah it was i th- i found this really really amazing i loved it uh I, the the song is not my, my cup of tea really but gosh the 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 technology is definitely my sort of thing all, uh, in his other videos, same thing. I love the technology behind it all. It's got the the the, the quality of the imagery, and that the, there's one which uh, I forget what it's called now, but it's basically uh, space photo photography from the ground, time lapse stuff, and it's just uh, it's beautiful. There was another topic I completely forgot about this one, but this one's actually pretty cool. Uh, have you got time for this? But uh, this is the uh, I Connectivity Play Twelve. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, right. Talk about this. Yeah. Go for it. So this oh, is uh, just back. announced yesterday. I also think it was. It's the the I connectivity uh, ready, play twelve. This is essential for people like me who are building elaborate stage shows. With so Ethernet just... MIDI, I can send and receive MIDI from pretty much anywhere in the venue, no matter so it's a how big the output, stage is. A ten output plus headphones. On the front, you'll notice a stereo headphone A and B output selector. Monitoring. So it's an audio interface. You can also plug in two computers to the play audio twelve simultaneously via the two USB jacks. Play Audio 12 will automatically switch from computer one to computer two in case of a failure. On the front of the device is a USB MIDI host port that can support up to eight USB MIDI devices simultaneously. This is perfect if you're using MIDI controllers. I'm just gonna fast forward it a bit because I mean the, the payoff is USB A and USB basically I'm unplugging B, it. Even though that's weird to say. So whenever I trigger uh, the Ableton session, it's going to be blinking green. When it goes into failover mode and something happens to this computer, it'll start flashing red and it will seamlessly switch from computer A to computer B. So I'm going to simulate a computer failure now by unplugging the USB cable. One, two, three, four. I trigger both of my tracks, everything's going great. Someone falls side stage, they unplug a computer, boom. It automatically switches. You can now notice how we're flashing red now. This computer is no longer playing. We're now playing on this computer solely. It's so seamless. Basically, that's the whole thing. You know, I mean, traditionally to do this, it's kind of quite a complex set of things. I mean, I think we talked about a video some time back where this guy made a kind of cheaper version of it. And I think he was using some iConnectivity products then uh, where it was there were two computers involved and various kind of uh, relay switches and all sorts of stuff. But this is actually something commercially available or will be shortly. I think it's 599, uh, is it 599 or maybe 699? 599 US dollars, you get 10 audio outputs and two... USB inputs with two computers that fail over and you know like it love it or hate it you know this is a big part of what happens in a live situation you know people have got playback from various reasons or whatever and you know you could that could it could be playback or it could be virtual instrument racks that were running on each play you know so you're playing the stuff and it falls over and then the other one kicks in so it doesn't have to be kind of like I'm not a musician I think it could be any of those things I, I just thought Wow, that is a really smart. Th- I mean, they are smart people, and a lot of their stuff is pretty cool. I'm, Charles, I'm, you're you're about to do a tour. I mean, obviously, you probably want a bit of uh, quality testing on this before you would invest in something like that. But I mean, do you have failover in your situation, and is this something that you'd be interested in? We do, but it's not that seamless. We have uh, those radial switching DIs, and um, <clears throat> we're running two Pro Tools rigs that uh, with you know, interfaces, so it switches over. But uh, yeah, I, in fact, once I saw this, I immediately sent a link to the tour manager and Andy and Paul from LMD. Like, th- guys, this is this is something we need. This is really great. <laughs> Although I'm not sure it has enough outputs because we need, because we have four different guys on stage, all who want different clicks. So there's there's four of your outputs right there. And then we, we need quite a few other things because we'll we'll do a lot of stereo like string sections and things like that um so it may not have enough outputs but if you can cascade them you know yeah absolutely i mean there may be a way to do that within ableton i don't know if we can do that in pro tools but um yeah but i did send this to him because i th- I think this this is a great thing a really great thing i i definitely would i, I in fact i would i'll probably pick one up just to have it as a spare 
Yeah, it could be something that's particularly useful. The other thing that's nif nifty about it is because it's got the host port, but it's also got an Ethernet port for RTP MIDI. So you can run law, you could use it as as part of a way of distributing MIDI from those two computers out into the world of maybe your other stuff for program changes and things. I know, Steve, I don't know if you do much live playing or whether this is sort of in your universe, but I mean, it's 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 certainly a jolly useful thing, right? Uh, yes, that's absolutely true. Um, yeah, I'm doing quite a lot of live playing at the moment, pretty much every uh, uh, weekend, every other weekend anyway. Um, having a, a sort of fail-safe mechanism for a computer to set up is something that I've been, you know, working with and trying to get a, a, a stable um, uh, set up for quite a long time. Um, and, and really all I have at the moment is I go from like using just one laptop and if that goes down, which luckily it hasn't done so far, it's just straight to recorded audio. Um, and it, and that can't be seamless, not with the sort of setup that I have. So there's, there's, there's always going to be obvious, uh, an obvious moment with the audience that something's gone wrong. Um, this unit here could actually be like a real um, saving grace for the kind of live stuff that, that I do. Not saving grace, a saviour, if you know what I mean. Um, but I'm going to have to investigate this a little bit more uh, clearly and carefully. A bit like Charles said, I mean, it, it, um, uh, it, it looks like it could really do this job. But it's, you know, if you're going to rely on something for live, you've got to make sure it works. So I think uh, more investigation. Yeah, well, that's required. the thing. I mean, then you get a single point of failure, which is the unit itself, I suppose. So, you know, that <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. part of the problem. I mean, you know, the, the situation there is, okay, well, I mean, I guess the thing is that you could do, if that, if that were the case, you have just another audio interface lying around, which has enough outputs, say, you know, 10 outputs that you can plug in. Okay, there'll be a break. But sometimes the audience responds to something going wrong well it sort of draws them in you know it's not necessarily what you'd want for the opening of the olympics for instance but you know sometimes if something goes wrong it kind of it does generate an empathy but which can help yeah well this is something that i think is very important with electronic music it's that it's so easy to set up a, an automated system that just removes any sense of um jeopardy from the performance and and not having the sense that there's something uh, at risk or at stake with the performer means the audience tends to disconnect. But if you make mistakes and very occasionally, you know, I might do that. It does bring people <laughs> in. It draws them in. It shows that you're yeah. fragile. But that really only works if you're walking with working in small events, as you say. I wouldn't want to do yeah. it for the Olympics. No. Although that could be fun. You know, yeah. if I was asked. That's probably that's probably my why, why my audience responds so fantastically at all my gigs because it's just it's just a continual <laughs> liturgy of mistakes and cock ups. <laughs> Yes. What do you think? I mean, I'm not, you know, aside from the whether you love or hate the, uh, the the notion of machines being involved. Oh no! I mean, you know, really great as a, if you're using a computer as a plug-in host for sure. You know, and I've been in situations where this, you know, as a solution would be great. You know, for uh, running two computers for the redundancy system. Uh, you know, I as I make it very clear, I despise backing tracks with a passion and I want to call out all bands for using them for cheating. Ah, anyway, that's that other point. I always like to vent my spleen when it comes to backing tracks and the crime and conning <laughs> and bloodless disgrace of using backing tracks. Down with them. I hate them. Anyway, but, you know, but for using it for hosting, <laughs> VSDs and that sort of thing, then really good. And, uh, you know, computers are, um, although I, a lot more reliable now, but there still is that factor, isn't there, um, uh, of uh, stability uh, and that peculiar thing of, you know, stress testing your system and then you go out, first gig, something goes wrong. So uh, this definitely has a good, uh, a, a, you know, ah. Oh, yeah, and I mean the amount of equipment you'd have to have used to run a system that would do this, this oh, it's ludicrous. I mean, you know, I've been involved in stuff where this would have been just the most perfect, elegant solution. So yeah, I think they're definitely onto something here. I just don't like the fact that it's going to make it easier for people to use backing tracks. So I'm a bit conflicted on that front. <laughs> yeah, no, I can understand that. I mean, I think that's the thing, as Charles alluded to, the fact that it's only outputs. You know, if you want to process stuff in real time, you kind of you, you can't. It hasn't got any input. So I mean, if they can leverage oh, yeah. this technology to work uh, yeah. for both in and out, or you know, more outputs or whatever, then that makes sense. So I, it, I get the feeling it, this might be a tester. It, 
it does feel a bit suspiciously like it's pl it's playing to the backing track market then though so then <laughs> in that case i i condemn it with all the condemnation i can muster <laughs> I wonder how it works. So, for instance, if you've wanted to make an aggregate device, uh, so you had some inputs, you had another, maybe a FireWire device or a USB device, and you aggregated it with the Play Audio 12, whether when you're both plugged in, both computers can see the device and you uh, and create an aggregate for it so that, therefore, you could use it for that. I wonder if that, because that would be the potential, but whether or not it sort of just goes... No, it must do, because if they're both playing at the same time, it must... It, mm -hmm. mu it must be available to both units at the same time, right? I guess. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, it's going to so. yeah, yeah, so. use the same the same technique as the uh, iConnect four that I've got here, which um, where you can put two two computers onto that. You know, so you can have two computers sharing that that particular device as well. But ah, it's just this in one. It, it, Interesting Sorry. question from uh, Yeri in the chat room. Can you use the USB port, because it's got a host port on it, to run other audio interfaces? Hmm. Mm, that is an interesting question. Good question. No, I don't No, I don't think so. Based on the other iConnect one that I've got here, it's just, uh, I think it's only MIDI. Oh, uh, ah. uh, you can only host, honestly, yeah, you can host eight, eight MIDI devices on it. Um, but, yeah, so what happens if you're running two computers, uh yeah, I don't know quite. You have to do like an aggregate thing, I think. I just remember how to use it now. Um, I was yes, using you did with, with, with iPads. That's right. Yeah, yeah. iPads. Mm. Well, anyway, I just thought it was an interesting one to end on and nice to see someone addressing that, you know, in some way. And I hope I wish them every success with it, even though perhaps it goes against your particular philosophy, Gaz. It seems like it could be a very useful thing. <laughs> I, I guess we better wrap things up. It's, time is marching on. It's been a super long show, which has been, uh, but I, I don't feel bored and I hope nobody else has been at all. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Um, Gaz, thank you for joining me uh, this week. I, I, I'm going to see you on early on Saturday morning for that uh, lift up to Sheffield, right? Sure, sure, first. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Looking Excellent. forward to it. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks, everyone. And uh, also, Steve, thank you for joining us too. It's been a pleasure having you aboard. I think your bandwidth has held up. You can, uh, uh, I hope you haven't uh, maxed out your data allowance too much on your tethering. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sure I'll discover pretty soon. But no, this, my, my aspect of this session has been rescued by O2. So well done. Well, if you could bring them on board as a sponsor, I'd be more than happy to uh, to give you a cut. <laughs> See what you can do. I'll have a word. Yeah, yeah. nice one. Yeah. I'm sure you know the people at the top. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, also, Mr. Charles Chicky Reeves, uh, sublime-uk.com, uh, stevehillier.net, of course, gaswilliams.me. Thank you very much for joining us too, Charles. It's been a pleasure having you. Gladly. Gladly. I'll, uh, I'll Hopefully, I'll see you next week. I'm off to New York this week, but I'll uh, be back hopefully before the next show. Great. Okay. Hopefully. Uh, I hope so too. And so that's it for this week. I want to say, don't forget, if you want to enter the competition to win a copy of Isotopes RX6, you want to tweet the hashtag wave repair. That's one word. And the hashtag RX6 to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. You'll be entered into the competition. That's it for this week. We can, we can all wave. We'll see you all next time. Thanks for watching.